and the audio is good. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and check that audio. Let's see. Let me get that window in the background that I have. Um, wait, I want to save this real quick. Thanks for watching. All right, cool. Got that saved. I can minimize this. Let's see how YouTube is looking. All right, I hear myself talking. Let me just do listen to myself for a little bit while I wait for this. Welcome in. We've got Dave and Jerry and JHM and Rhonda. They're all here so far. And Justin Miller. Heck yes. Oh, yeah. Welcome in. Welcome in. We're going to be talking Astro Modified Cameras tonight. And let's see. How does that audio sound? <laughs> I mean, it's so far so good, but we'll see how loud it is here in a sec. Uh, uh, uh. Ah, man, there we go. I feel like I'm okay volume. I think it's just turned down on my end. Yeah, cool. Looks like everything's solid. I don't have to listen to this anymore. Oh, I will once I have Clarence. That's right. Snowy mono. Yeah, it's so cool. All right, so we're just in the pre-show, the hangout until we go live. You'll be probably hearing me or seeing me talk to Clarence here in a moment, but you won't be actually hearing. You'll see me talk, but won't be hearing. Mark Moore is here. Awesome. Welcome in, Mark. Um, how's the weather out there? I was just listening from Blake. He's up in Mono and Mammoth area, and of course, there's not snow in Southern California like there is in Mono, but there's a lot of snow there right now, eight inches, he said, so that's pretty fantastic. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -bum. Um, everyone will probably say whether the sound, oh, Rhonda says sounds good here. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, sweet. <laughs> Bob says it sounds good as well. Sweet. Awesome. That's confirmed twice over. I'm going to mute that audio now so I don't have a problem with that. And man, cool. Ron S is here. Welcome in. Howdy, howdy. Ah, so be thinking. Don't write them yet, but be thinking what your questions are going to be for Clarence as we're going to be taking us through each question that you're coming up with or a question that I'm bringing towards him. You're also going to have a chance to see him edit a, you know, a shot that came from an Astro Modified camera. So we'll get some tips on some beginner stuff. Ah, just raining in Southern Cal, 58 degrees today. Right on. Awesome. Da, 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 da. Um, so, do, 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 I'm trying to think of how to entertain you guys as we're waiting for the last six minutes, but I don't have to entertain you. So I guess I don't really need to do anything. I am going to put these notes up and I realize that that was something I wanted to do next. And I'm not going to save that. I'm going to close out that, but where's my Q and a question? I, uh, I think it was in my. OBS template. Do, ba, do, do. So we're about to go live. We're hanging out in chat. Um, looks like oh, it looks like it's time for me to turn this on, and I won't be speaking with you all anymore as I hang out with Clarence. So I'll be back here shortly to go live with you. I'll kick on the videos here in about a minute and a half, where most of you will rewatch them again as you wait for us to get. Oh, looks like Grant has joined the chat and has brought up the cats. <laughs> hail Aaron. You know, I don't mind the hail Aaron. I should be less arrogant and be humble about it, but I don't mind it. 36 degrees this morning for Grant out there in Oregon and Bandon. Uh, show your Venus fly traps. That's entertainment. <laughs> I Actually, I really should because they're going into dormancy so shortly, and they're all nice and red looking. It's fantastic. Audio is gone. Yeah, audio was gone because I was talking to Clarence behind the scenes. We're getting everything set up for the live stream starting here in four minutes. 
And let's just say this. If you actually want to see the Venus, well, no, I don't have time today because I have a hard stop at 8 o'clock tonight. So we'll be getting this going very quickly. Um, you guys enjoy the repeat of these two videos as we're getting ready for the final four-minute countdown. And I'll be back, and we'll start off where I will begin the live stream talking about our topic, and then I'll bring in our guest, Clarence Spencer from Spencer's Cameras. All right, so talk to you at Spencer's camera.com all right guys one sec see you in four minutes getting focus is one of the tougher things to do with your stars and mostly it's just you fighting with your camera gear especially when you're really wishing 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 that your star was like a perfect little circle but it's not it's more like this shape You've got this shape that you're trying to go, oh, okay, that's the best, tightest circle I can get. Your stars won't be circles. They will just be orbs of white that finally have a shape. And that tightest shape that you could possibly make it is what you end up with. How do you get there? How do you find this? Let me tell you. This is my Carson Lumi Loop. Right here above of this is a link, a quick text link, so you can go watch that focus video right now. But this is my number one tip for getting great focus when I'm doing Milky Way photography. I take this because it has a plastic cup that keeps it perfect distance from it, flush right up against my LCD screen. And then I tweak it until I get the perfect focus. There's one more tip that I wanna give you tonight, and it is one that if you have really good vision and you can see dots on the back of your LCD screen, this is gonna be a quick tip to help you know, oh wow, okay, I can see the dots, I'm out of focus. Check out this clip of me and Escalante explaining it right there on scene. There's a way you can quickly see the difference on the back of your screen, even if you're not sure if you quite nailed the focus. Look at the difference. Can you notice the difference between them? This is just slightly out of focus, and yet I can tell immediately that I, I missed. And what is it that's giving it away? It's the brighter magnitude stars. Are there too many dots? If you start to see the stars as more than just a sea of specks of sand, but you start to see the brightest magnitude stars standing out, that's when you know you're out of focus. As I go more out of focus, watch how the brighter magnitude stars start to pop off the screen. And then here's even greater out of focus. It's so obvious when you look at it this way. If you're seeing a whole sea of stars, but there's standouts. If you have a lot of standouts, if you have just a few, I mean, look at this image. This one, you can see that there's definitely a few that stand out that are really bright. Antares, the planets, obvious ones are standing out. Back here, though, when I go over, there's a sea of them from corner to corner, middle, far left, far right. So if you have too many dots, that means the brightest magnitude stars are standing out. And when those brightest magnitude stars stand out, you know it's gone a little too far on the out of focus range. So try again. Awesome. Making sure your lens is as open as possible is the easy mode, best way to get a solid Milky Way shot. All right, Lobby, I won't go ahead and show that right now. We'll not worry about this. It says 10 minutes timing, but we have seconds. We only have seconds. Welcome in. Just thinking about your questions that you might have for Clarence Spencer. We're about to start officially for Milky Way Wednesday any second. In fact, I should start right now because why not? I don't think I've ever done that. Let's start early. Woohoo! Welcome in. Hey, hey, welcome in everybody to Milky Way Wednesday. I'm Aaron King. I'm with PhotogAdventures.com. I've been doing Milky Way Wednesday now for ever since 2019. I believe I started even, nah, not 2018. I did it in 2019 for the first time ever. I even had that first year we went into Halloween and it was trick-or-treating time and I was still doing Milky Way Wednesday. I loved it. I was like, oh yeah, it's nice trick-or-treating. And then everyone was coming to my door and asking for treats and I'd run back into the live stream and continue going. So that was a blast. So what we're talking about tonight is the big challenge that all of us have, you included with me included, Milky Way in the winter. Now, 
Typically, I like to say, oh, it's fantastic, it's over, we don't have all that work that we have to do anymore. The Milky Way core has set so we can relax our photography, do maybe more landscape, and just enjoy the winter. Especially for me, as I was going through a divorce, and I was coming to the end of the year, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to take a good break, save some money, and not travel. But this year, I think we're all feeling it. We want to do more, and we're going to do that here in Winter Milky Way but the extra challenge of doing a panorama. So if you weren't around for us a week, two weeks ago, I think it was only, I think it was two weeks ago, or you've not listened to the podcast yet where I share these tips. I'm going to remind everyone about the five things that you really need to get your winter Milky Way right, which is why we have our guest tonight. It's number five. So number one, the panorama, when it works, is going to be between 22 degrees to 52 degrees. What's happening is you've got this arch of the Milky Way and it talks about the core being visible, but then it has the full max elevation of the Milky Way at that highest point of the arch. And it tells you in photo pills where that is. And so the proper timing, if you look at it in degrees, is roughly between 22 degrees and 52. I say roughly because my favorite time looking at pictures that I have captured was when it was between 30 and 45. That was the sweet spot for that panorama. So if you want a panorama to work out, you got to look at photo pills and look at that setting down there and listen to the podcast if you want to hear more about it, but you'll see it. Milky Way max elevation is at 30 degrees to 45 is the sweet spot or anywhere will work between 22 degrees and 52. The second tip was that we're not looking to the east for this panorama. We're looking west, which means we have a whole new set of foregrounds that we can play around with looking to the west to capture that Milky Way panorama. And so I'm going to pull up the chat real quick so we get everyone talking. We got some good all caps questions already going and vid shanks thank you so much everybody remember if you want to make sure your question wants to get hit and i don't forget to ask clarence spencer do what vid shanks did and give me an all caps comment then i'll know when i'm scrolling through there there's a question we want to hit up so if you as you have questions throughout the q a we will see the all caps i'll see them I'm pointing the wrong direction. No, I'm pointing the right direction. When I see the all caps, I know to read it. And then if I don't see the all caps, I may miss it. And we'll go through. And as we're going through tonight, we're also going to see Clarence actually show us how he edits some of his images so that you can get an idea of like, okay, how much different will the editing process be for me handling an Astro modified image? So then tip number three, when is good? Okay, Aaron, I'm excited about going. I know the panorama has to be at that degree. Also looking west, I have some cool subjects that I can look at, but when else can it work? Well, in November, you can know just quickly that I'm going to hold this up high so I can look at it this way. 4 a.m. to the morning is what you're looking at in November. So you're going to go up very, very early before work or stay up really, really late at night. Your call. Now, in December through January, you're already good at 1 a.m. going into the morning because as it goes in the morning, it just kind of sets more and more and more because it starts off above you and then works its way down to that degree of 52 degrees. And from about 1 o'clock in the morning on, it's setting lower and lower and lower, which is interesting because that's the experience that the Southern Hemisphere has looking at their core. They have that kind of a experience looking off to the west and seeing it set like that. So we're kind of getting a feeling, us Northern Hemispheres, we get a feeling of what the Southern Hemisphere experiences. Number four, this is a tip on its own, even it's just the same thing as before, but it's a key element here. In February and March, you can actually do both. That winter Milky Way in the west and the summer Milky Way panorama in the east. And just the timing is 11 p.m. until it finally sets over there. Then you wait for the few hours for the Milky Way to rise on this side of the sky. And then you'll watch from 4 a.m. until morning between February and March. And then lastly, the five key point that you need to have in order to make sure your winter Milky Way is rock solid and awesome is what Clarence Spencer is here with us for to talk about. And you guys get asked questions just like Vid Shanks. So hit us up. Oh, Paolo Berger Mo's here. Awesome. And Mary Beth. Yeah, fantastic. Some of my best friends are here. I love it. I can't say best friends because then it makes me, makes me sound like I have favorites. I don't have favorites. You're all my favorites. But I haven't said hi to Jim or Tim or David or Chris. And I haven't said hi to Alan yet or Kathy. And I already said to Grant, the audio's back. Perfect. Okay, cool. All right. Let's bring in our guest. And joining me now is our friend Clarence Spencer from Spencer's Camera. Welcome in, Clarence. How's it going, man? 
It's awesome having you on again and having a chance to talk about something that we keep hitting a little bit, but I keep feeling like we're just not quite completing the discussion on this. Um, you know what? I don't think they actually heard you. Go ahead and say something real quick. How's that? Can you hear me now? I hear you just fine, but I'm going to have to use this one. So I'm going to use this <laughs> screen so that they can actually hear you. So welcome okay. in again, Clarence. Hi, glad to be here. Yeah, I think everyone's going to be hearing you now. I'll probably get some notifications from 30 seconds ago that it wasn't working, but no worries. So Clarence, the first thing I have to ask when you're thinking about doing a panorama with the Winter Milky Way, <clears> have <throat> you done it yet? Um, I did. I haven't done a lot, but I did one um, a couple of years ago that I really loved. I was very happy with it. It was up in the city of Rocks in Idaho. Um, super dark and turned out spectacular. Um, oh, yeah? Of course, being cold, it's a lot harder to get out. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it's, it's something I want to do more of. I've done a lot more lately of deep sky shooting. Uh, you know, the, 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 those dimmer objects are a lot harder to reach and grab sometimes, but I need to get out and do more of those um, winter Milky Way panels. So when you're going out and using your <clears throat> modified camera, have you used it exclusively throughout the summer? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you have any experience with the winter? Do we have anything with an Astro modified camera to consider when it comes to the cold? Is that a concern? Uh, not really. Just, I mean, the, the basics of, you know, batteries can, can die on you very quickly, that kind of thing. But as far as an Astro modified yeah. camera, there's really no difference. Okay, right on. <clears throat> well, let me go into one of the first questions that we have already. Oh, Clarence is really loud compared to Aaron. So go ahead and tell me this answer while I fix your audio for a sec, because I got to <clears throat> pretty okay. loud. Basically, what I'm going to say is when we're thinking about trying to capture with the Astro Modified Camera, in the process of you capturing an image, what differences, if any, are there to the capture process with an Astro Modified Camera? Well, not... Well, as far as the winter Milky Way is concerned, there's really not any difference or very little. Um, but with an Astro modified camera, and I noticed one of the first questions that popped up uh, in the chat was regarding color. Um, uh, yeah. And with an Astro modified camera, that's something that's kind of critical uh, to make life easier on you. Uh, one of the most important things I have found, um, especially with full spectrum, is to shoot a custom white balance or capture a custom white balance using the in-camera functions to do that. You can manually set a Kelvin, but that won't quite get you there. Um, and every camera has a way to do that. Um, I'm mostly a Canon shooter, but uh, you know, for our when we're doing modifications, I've learned every camera very well, and they all do a great job doing that. Once you do a custom white balance, then that solves 90% of your color problems. Okay. When you're dealing with that color issue, is it something that if you didn't change your white balance, would there be any real extra challenge with that? Or is it just a personal preference thing? No, oh, that it's a little harder to get your color temperature and tint perfect. You mm. can manually do that. And I, and I have customers tell me, well, I'm shooting in raw, so it doesn't matter what my color balance is. Well, it doesn't theory, you know, technically, but it sure solves a lot of headache if you do a custom white balance. When the camera sets a custom white balance internally using its built-in functions, it corrects more than just color temperature. It also is tweaking that tint. And so it will really refine it really nicely. And it gets you to a really good basis point when you're starting to edit your files. And I've, when we get into editing a few of these, I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, awesome. So with that question that you started addressing, Vid Shanks was saying that he uses the VA plus HA. So I guess VA is what? Well, it's the visible plus H alpha filter ah. he's shooting on his full spectrum. So it's basically allowing the camera to capture normal visible light like a normal camera, but a little more sensitive to capture that HA or hydrogen alpha. Okay, cool. So then on that same question, I w it was asked that, can you tell us, uh, pum, 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 pum. make sure you guys use all caps. It helps me find them fast when I'm going back and forth. What do you, Tim Farmer asked, what do you set your custom white balance to? Because that's my big issue, he says. <clears throat> so and like I said, it's better if you can get the camera to do it automatically by forcing it to use it, its own internal custom white balance. So in Nikon, it's called a preset white balance. In Canons, it's custom white balance. I think uh, Sony, it's custom white balance. But um, so in a Canon, I'll, I'll tell you kind of how you do that. Um, you will just turn the camera on fully auto. And then with whatever filtering you're going to use, if any, 
You will capture an image of a gray card out in the fully lit sun or just green grass out in the full, full lit sun. Um, the camera will use that to calibrate the colors and that will give you a very good natural looking image pretty much straight out of the camera. Like anything, you will still want to, if you know most people, to tweak and correct those color temperatures to your liking. Gotcha. Okay, so everyone, let me know if that was sufficient walkthrough as you were requesting. About three people <clears throat> requested the same thing, Clarence, of like walking through that process. I believe right. you covered it, but honestly, with your cameras, if you had any further questions, hit me with all caps. So there's another question about it. Also, I'm going to comment because Kathy, that Italian beef sounds really delicious right now. I wish I had <clears throat> that. That's awesome. So let's go. Balanced sound. Perfect. That's what I was going to ask you guys too. Sweet, sweet, sweet. So SM Wilk says, Spencer's Astro Modified my 5D Mark III a few months ago, uh, encyclopedic website, knowledgeable staff, prompt service. They were amazing. Thank you, Spencer's camera. So that's a awesome. big thanks from SM Wilk. So fantastic props there. Awesome. Give it, it to you. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Um, right here is a new question. So the gray card, save it. Perfect. Okay, good. <clears throat> is that custom white balance good for day and night? Ron asks. So usually um, during the day, you're gonna use a different filter. If your, if your camera has been modified internally with the visible plus H alpha filter, then you can probably get away with the same white balance for day or night. Um, most likely that will work fine. It still won't be perfect because the camera is still letting in all that H alpha. And the best way to get a normalized image straight out of the camera is by using a UVIR blocking filter or what's commonly called a hot mirror filter. Okay. Um, they're best if they're may if they're used on the front of the lens. If they're the little clip-ins, they can tend to cause focus problems on the outer edges of your image or discoloration on the outer edge. But the ones on the front of the lens work perfectly. Okay, awesome. Here's a new question. Um, the question is: Has Clarence ever done a white balance setup on YouTube or made any video for them to check and see how that's done? And specifically, possibly for each camera, you know, Sony, that's, Canon. Yeah, yeah, that's something we're planning to do. I know Matt Diederich, who is one of our ambassadors, uh, he did a great video on custom white balance. I think it was specific to Nikon's. Okay. And so, if you look up his YouTube channel, there's a great white balance. Uh, video. I've referred that or emailed it to a lot of people and it's been helpful, but that's in the works. Um, the, the studio that we have here, that's a lot of the things we're going to be doing is a lot of the custom white balance things and all right. About 50 other topics we'll be covering. Okay, sweet. Fantastic. So one question that came through still on the Kelvin was basically, Aaron, what's your standard Kelvin number? And for when I'm handling a Kelvin number, as everyone knows, your camera is going to handle it very well. You're going to see that, okay, how does this actually go into all? I'll go into the chat with just me so that uh, they can see me nice and large. So you're going to be able to handle that Kelvin in post-processing and change it up and down and get your perfect white balance and color in the end of your post-processing. So why is it important, Aaron, to have a Kelvin in the first place when it comes to other photography? Well, typically it's because you don't want your camera going auto ISO. And if you do a panorama, you don't want it to change in between. But Aaron, can't I just take that camera, that image from image two, three, four, and five and say, hey, all of you go to 6,500, all of you go to 4,400, all of you go to whatever number I want? Yes and no. Yes, you can change them all to go back there. I've only had it happen once, but I still reference it as a time that I say, warning, 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 because you might have sand like I had in the dark where it's low and poorly exposed that in between the auto ISO capture of, change, I'm sorry, auto ISO, auto white balance capture going from here, 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 there were just enough differences that even when I conformed them all to the exact same number, it still had this weird kind of difference at the edge where the seam was merging in the pano. And I hated that and I wished I could get rid of that. And it's never happened again since because I've been consistent. I learned from Royce Bear. I'm like, I'm gonna just go with something. So what Kelvin, 3,800 up until 5,000, somewhere within there is great and just pick one, be consistent. And then every single capture will have the same kind of action happening from sensor setting to the camera right in your card. Just everything about it, just there's something consistent consistent that will work 
with you later when you merge, and I've found consistency being true after that. So at that point, it's just anecdotal evidence, but that's what I go with. So in that same vein, Clarence, when you're thinking about having an opportunity to change your white balance for a specific setting to work with, they have to white balance and color correct, blah, blah, blah. But have you ever found yourself changing it multiple times, or do you stick with one like I was talking about and then just stay consistent. How does that work for you with the Astro Mod? So what I usually do is, again, I'm, I'm more of a Canon shooter, but every Canon or camera has its own uh, capabilities of doing this differently. So Canon, um, you can go out and shoot your gray card image and save that image on the memory card. And then I write protect that so it can't mm. be deleted. Then I can reference to that. So every time I get a new memory card, I'll put that in the camera. I'll set down and shoot the gray card images with different filters. And I did notice a question earlier that this references, uh, if you're gonna shoot infrared photography with it, then put that infrared uh, it filter on your camera and capture a different white balance for that. But I'll store up to a dozen or more white balance gray card images on the memory card that I can then refer to easily. Now, one other thing that I, you know, everyone loves their camera. They, they shoot Nikon for <laughs> right. one reason or Sony's. Everybody has their favorites. Well, one reason or one thing I love about shooting my Canon gear that I've really fallen in love with is the white balance bracketing function that's built into their newer cameras. So I think starting around the 5D Mark III generation up till now, you can go in, capture one image, and the camera will record up to seven different white balance oh, uh, cool. files. So for instance, I shoot the Canon R6 and R5. Well, the R5 is a 45 megapixel camera and I shoot raw and JPEG for another dumb reason I'll explain later. <laughs> but okay. the, um, it'll store 14 files for one exposure, but seven of them are all different white balances that I can then pull up on my computer scroll through, find the one that pleases me the best, and then I use those to, pro to post-process and I'll just delete the rest. Gotcha. Um, and I'll show you that too later when we, when we get into the editing. Okay, cool. So there's a few more questions that are coming our way about that color balance <clears throat> and dealing with that. But just I'll say this one only. Are you setting up a Clarence Spencer or Spencer's Camera YouTube channel where you'll have some of this information there or will it be on their website only? It'll be both. There is a YouTube page, just youtube.com slash Spencer's Camera. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a few brief editing tips and things like that on there now that we've kind of used to help us get it up and running. But uh, there will be a lot more to come there uh, on YouTube, and they'll be on the website as well. All right, cool, everybody. I'm going to cover up Clarence's face for a sec, or I'll cover his, his telescope. You can see it right there, Spencer's <laughs> camera and photo. And they go right in. I'm going to click subscribe. Everyone say thanks to Clarence today and hit subscribe, but you'll also be able to be notified. Hit the bell. You know, everyone hit the bell, and then you'll be notified when he has a new video in there, especially those ones that you're all looking for with the color balance. And join us on there as a subscriber to Spencer's camera's YouTube channel. Awesome. So here we go. Let me go ahead. Oh, Ron. S has a good question before we transition to any of the edit, but I did have a comment from Frank. He says, hey, Aaron King, Spencer's is doing my Z6 for an Astro Mod right now. So that's fantastic. I don't know if you recall working on a Z6 today, but Frank is getting one from you, Frank Pally, and also Alan Houdina says, I agree. Great service from Spencer's. So I want to get as many mad props as we can on this tonight, everybody. If you've had personal experience with Clarence and their team working on your camera, Camera, let us know so that we can get people who watch this replay in the future to be like, you know what? I am going to go to Clarence Spencer and go to spencerscamera.com and actually get my own Astro modified camera. So, question from Ron S. He goes, Does it matter if the camera white balance uses RAW or JPEG version of the image? Uh, it doesn't. When, when you open the RAW file in, say, Camera Raw or Lightroom, you must tell it to use the as shot color temperature and it should import that pretty well. Sometimes it might be a little different from what you saw on your LCD screen, but it still gets you to that really good basis point to start your editing from there. Gotcha. Sweet. Mary Beth says he's the bestest. So you have a sweet, <laughs> <laughs> sweet comment coming from Mary Beth. And everyone, she's the bestest too, because if you go and look at her Instagram, you'll see some examples of a winter Milky Way panorama over all of Factory Butte. And that's where my eyes were like, oh, 
I have seen the glory, and I need to join her, and I haven't yet. And Vanessa Franking says, he modified one for me, fast and excellent. So that's terrific, Vanessa. Another good bad props and awesome. comment for Spencer's Thank camera. You. So I'm going to hit you up with a few of the basics right now while we let some other questions come in before <clears> we go into the edit. Now, this is stuff that is obvious, but I just want to check it off the list. Spence, or Clarence, I got a new camera from you. I go out and I go to use it. The first thing I do is throw in my IRIX lens. Are all of your Astro modified modifications with the drop-in filters, or is that just some of them? Just some. The, the ones we do with the filter uh, drop-in are the Canon R series or mirrorless series cameras. It has the the um, the little drop-in filter with the adapter, this is for the R series cameras to use the EF mount lenses. Ah. So you can put any filter. There's about, I think, 18 different filters for different uses, uh, deep sky shooters, all that stuff. We have all those filters and all your lenses, as long as they're EF with this will work perfectly fine. Um, RF lenses for Canons are, uh, will all work perfectly fine. Some have a little bit of an issue, but if you're interested in an R modification, reach out to us and we'll talk to you about those. All other cameras that's all um, calibrated perfectly, they'll all work really well, no matter what lens you put on it. Okay, sweet. So then when you're thinking about, I want to do wide field Milky Way panorama, <clears throat> is there any different process for when I want to attach it to my telescope mount like you have behind you and use it for that purpose? Oh, it works perfectly fine. Okay. That's, that's the most challenging and most difficult part of modifying these cameras is perfecting that focus. Uh, if the focus is off a little, you'll get soft corners or um, you know, bad distortions, uh, or your ultra wide angle lenses may not work well, or they'll work and not your telephoto lens. So that's the very, that's the most difficult part of these modifications. Gotcha. Okay. So then when I'm thinking about a brand newbie coming into this and they go for their normal setting, they're thinking, Oh boy, um, the histogram, do I need to worry about a separate exposure histogram when dealing with an astro modification? Not really, no. I mean, you still want to look at the histogram and watch it. You'll find that with your Astro modified cameras, you'll you'll be able to cut back on your exposure time a little or reduce your ISO a little bit because it is more sensitive to light. So that's one of the added benefits is, of course, the longer the exposure or the higher the ISO, you get more noise and other problems. So that's one of those benefits is it helps with those, those issues. You know, it's funny because Bob just said the same thing. He's like, Spencer's did my 6D last year, and it's a much better performer. So he's already seen the better performance thanks to that. And I personally can vouch that, was it an R6 I borrowed from you or an R5? It was an R6, right? I think it was an R6, yeah. So when I'm out there with the R6 and I'm looking at it with my Canon, the one that you guys are looking at me from right here, I constantly battle with people's stupid camera bodies that they bring me on workshops, and they're like, I can't see the stars. Aaron it's just all black and I'm like why the heck aren't you seeing stars I'm like okay so we're like push this button try this let's turn this and then okay it's like hmm and then they start massaging the camera body and hoping you can coerce it to show some stars I have my 5d mark 4 and I'm like you should be seeing this it's like this is what you should be seeing how come we can't get that to work on your camera and it's my biggest frustration when I can't get the camera to see stars so that they can then get focus I put on that astro modified camera on my tripod and I'm like oh gosh I can't even appreciate the 5D Mark IV anymore with how much freaking data that I had now just on the back of the screen. One, I could see the stars focus brilliantly. Two, I, I know it's also the R6 mirrorless plus the Astro modification, but two, I had like the bright monitoring jealousy finally placated, finally like satiated because I was so jealous of you Sony users with that awesome, awesome bright monitoring. And then... Now, this Canon R6 with the Astro modification, I could see the foreground and the sky, and I lined up my shot so easy because of that. So I've loved the extra performance there. So then another newbie question, your, your histogram doesn't have to change much. You don't have to worry about much there. Um, when you're talking about an Astro modification and you've got a shutter length to choose from, do you find yourself ever pushing beyond star trailing a little bit just to get that color showing up even more? Or is it unnecessary because it comes through so freaking thick? Well, there's two things that you gain with an Astro modified camera. You gain more color, but you also gain more base luminance value oh, okay and the deep sky shooters really appreciate that probably more so than the milky way shooters luminance you'll, you'll see deep sky shooters 
adding layers of luminance that they capture with either hydrogen alpha or other filters to bring out that contrast. Well, it's already kind of built into the Astro Modified camera. So one of these pictures I'll show you that we're going to briefly edit, um, you'll see there's just a lot of luminance mm. making mm. This, the, the Milky Way really glow. Um, and then you could still add more luminance if you want. It's, it just increases the versatility. And really, overall, it just increases the contrast and detail. Ah, you're talking my language. When <clears throat> they think about using the Astro modded camera, then do they need to ever, let's just say it this way, two different questions. First question, when you have an Astro modified camera, how much, how do I phrase this without me and the answer? How much do you consider tracking necessary versus single image how much performance can you get with a single image astro modified image so you gain some by doing just single you know non-tracked images okay tracked images are always better no matter what camera you're shooting they will always be better amen um the the um examples that i'll show you to edit are non-tracked images um, they were areas where we had hiked in a little ways, yes. and so I didn't bring a tracker. So they'll give you a basis of a very simple, um, you know, capture, uh, usually about 10 exposures, and I'll show you what that brings out. But the, the you know, there's always a benefit to tracking. You'll never get away from that um, with today's technology, at least. I don't think you'll ever get away from that. Okay. I mean, that's fantastic because there's some of you out there that don't have a tracker yet or don't <clears throat> want to get into that. And you're like, okay, do I have the learning curve of the tracker and the learning curve of the Astro modified pro processing, or do I just tackle one or the other? And it sounds like you can still get a fantastic outcome without the tracker as an added difficulty. Okay, fantastic. So then the other question, the other part of that question was, have you ever benefited stacking the same kind of is stacking the same kind of benefit it would be for a non astro modified camera or is there different results with stacking with a tra with an astro modified camera no oh, the same same benefits it's just you're you're starting out with an overall better image and then you're increasing the benefits of tracking just like a normal an unmodified camera but you're starting at a at a higher quality point and then you're adding to that with tracking Okay, awesome. So a couple gear comments here, plus also another props to the team at Clarence Spencer's, spencerscamera.com. Dan Gallander says, Clarence Spencer and his team also modified a camera for me, a Sony a7 III, and I'm assuming it went really well. And so fantastic news that he got one. Um, <laughs> Mary Beth is like, Orion is calling. I agree, Mary Beth. I'm thinking about our, our, our January... Orion, where we waited for it to go up as high as we possibly could, but it went so high above Delicate Arch. I'm like thinking, oh man, I missed already the chance, or have I, to see Orion over there later in the night and get the good position for Delicate Arch. Oh, there's so many opportunities here. So gear question. Frank Pale says, hey, you know what? I did not send my camera lens in dispensers to be calibrated. Should I have actually sent it in? No. No, that, that's kind of a misnomer out there. Uh, some people will say, oh, bring it, send a, a, a lens in. Well, then what happens is they may tweak that lens to make it work wor right with the camera. Mm. Then it won't work well on other cameras. So what we do is we use the same equipment and technology and software as the manufacturers. And we do a base uh, solid, um, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Ba basically a universal calibration, just uh -huh. like a new camera is. That way any, any lens you put on it should work perfectly fine. Okay, fantastic. Bob Borkowski says, I'll be upgrading my Canon R to a Canon R6. Is the Canon R6 a good upgrade? I'm assuming that's what you meant, Bob. You missed the other six in there. So would you compare the Canon R to Canon R6? My opinion, the R6 is a lot better camera. The R is phenomenal, um, but the R6 is very noticeably better than the R. Okay, fantastic. Tim Farmer agrees. He loves his R mod. The R6 might be a better option, but better ISO performance maybe. And there's a question in here. Okay, Tim Farmer, for a deep field, when you're using your telescopes, is there a same filter as the wide field? Do you handle it completely differently? Uh, it depends. You know, light pollution is the concern with deep sky imaging. I mean, it is with Milky Way, but it's more so with deep sky imaging because you're you're forced to take much longer exposures, you know, on a guided uh, mount or something. Um, so there are some really great options for light pollution or light li uh, light pollution limiting filters uh, that work really well. The drop-ins for Canons work really nice. 
uh, but most telescopes have the capability of screwing in two inch filters and you can purchase pretty much anything out there that will work well. I'm a big fan of the Antlia brand um, filters. Optolong makes some good filters, but Antlia is a new company. They've been out for about a year, I think with their, uh, they make it's telescope specific. So they're two inch filters and they perform far out perform the, uh, the uh, Optolong filters in my opinion. Okay, right on. Mary Beth, you come to Salt Lake City. I can't wait to see you. So let me just go ahead and indulge a question with a very, not a full answer. Basically, he was asking a very specifically, um, let me say, who is he? He was Rakesh. Rakesh was saying, hey, I might have missed it. How much does it cost to actually modify, say, a Nikon Z7 II? So here at Spencer's Camera's website, um, Clarence, where would we take everyone to find out that answer for their individual gear? So on the on the top left, the little hamburger drop down. You, you click on that or hover over that. Cool. Um, and it'll it'll go to shopping, and then you would click on camera modifications or camera conversions. Um, then basically a full frame Nikon starts at three hundred fifty dollars. Same with Canons crop sensors. The filter material we use is a little cheaper, so it starts at three hundred and goes up from there. Okay. All right. So if you need to consider it as someone who has a camera and you're thinking, does it work? You have a nice list here with about 12 different cameras that you're saying can work. Panasonic, Pentax, Sony, Olympus. We all know that not every camera can work. What is the process where they get informed that their camera doesn't work for the same process that they want? So on the website, just underneath the Astro Modifications tab, there is a recommended camera list. Uh, we're probably two months out of date on that. We haven't listed one or two cameras that are new, but it'll show you what's highly recommended, what are just kind of recommended cameras, and then some that we tell you to stay away from. Okay. Um, I think I'm not finding it yet, the recommended ones. Yeah, go to, so if you click on that hamburger, yeah, menu, the little three lines, then underneath that, it'll show shopping. Shopping, and I go into shopping, and there's some underneath that. Ah, I didn't open yeah. up that more. There That's where it was. And yep. then I will see the Astro Camera Kits, Astro Cameras. And those ones in this list are the recommended ones just by default to be in here? Or? No, I, on the top uh, menu, there's Astro Conversions. Oh, um, Astro if, well, Conversions. Under, yeah, click, click Astro Conversions, and that will show you recommended camera, Astro Cameras. Uh, I see. So make sure if you're on a small window like I am, like on an iPad or a phone, that you make sure you use the plus signs in the menu system over here because that right, opened up right. a lot more options right here and recommended Astro cameras. In fact, I am just going to link the chat right now with that information so that everyone has it. Okay, cool. So we've indulged that. If anyone needs to check on their own camera, just go ahead and go to the website and get the process started with them. So now the last question I will take on before we go into the edit is going to be, um, you missed my question way up above Grant's. Okay, I want to make sure I catch Grant's question. Grant, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. I've almost got Grant's from maybe the very beginning of it. Uh, Clarence is really loud. Da -ba -da -ba -do. I must have missed it. Hill, Aaron, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to find it while I'm getting him going on the edit, Grant, just because I have missed it. I'm going to go back and find it. If you want to copy and paste it again, Grant, hook me up with it. But the question I'll ask here comes from did, 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 comes from Jim Foti, and he, or John. <laughs> I do that every week. John, will you compare an IR590NM image of the Milky Way with an Astro modified image? Are you familiar enough with an IR590NM image? Yeah, I, uh, in fact, I've shot um, early on, it's mm. been a couple of years, I did a lot of infrared only, or with the 590, the 665, all those others of the Milky Way. Um, again, you can use some of that for, most people do, for your luminance layers to put in the background of it to pump up the contrast. Um, but, you know, when we get into the editing, you'll see some examples of the, the different mods that we provide. Okay. 
Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and come back to me right here. So as Clarence, go ahead and share your screen with me and get ready for that. Let's get into the editing. Um, Tim Farmer was talking about, hey, you know what? I have the Skywatcher GTI, the Skywatcher Adventure GTI. Haven't quite figured it out yet, but he's wondering if it was good on a red cap. But he's also asking whether or not a filter that you were talking about, Clarence, was good for a red cat lens. Do you have any concerns whatsoever about working with a red cat on any Astro Modified filters? <laughs> okay awesome all right looks like we're ready to go ahead and get into the discussion on the edit keep the questions coming and please in the chat hit me up with an all caps question if i've missed a question that you've already asked that you're thinking ah, i don't know if aaron's gonna see this just do it again do it again in all caps make sure i don't miss it make sure that there's no problem with me seeing it um oh i'm gonna tweak one thing so that clarence is visible and much more visible than this actually you know we'll do this we'll have a little bit of background there and i'm gonna move clarence down a little bit before i bring him in all right, so Clarence, take it away. What are we seeing here at this picture and this place? So th this is that winter Milky Way shot that I talked about. I shot up at um, City of Rocks in Idaho. Uh, it's, it's a pretty large pano. The road in the foreground is really a straight road. Um, so it's over 180 degrees. Shot this with the modified Canon 6D Mark II. Uh, it's been probably four years ago that I shot this. And... Um, you can see there's a, a fair amount of detail out of there. Things are better now with the, with the mods that we perform, but this is a good representation of what can be done with, this is with the visible plus H alpha modification. Um, but you know, th there's a lot of detail in Andromeda there just over that peak to the right, but that's one good example of uh, a wintertime Milky Way shot with a modified camera. Man, that looks fantastic. I mean, it's so exciting to see all that detail popping off the screen. Even without the big dust lanes and interest of the Milky Way band, we still have a lot to play with. That looks awesome. Yeah. And, and it, before I get too far, Mary Beth is one of the masters of this. So you would look at her images on Instagram or Facebook, and those are all great examples of modified camera work, especially in the in the winter Milky Way stuff and, and Orion. Oh, um, yeah. Of Tim Farmer's like, I want my shoots to look like that. And so he's excited about having that. And apologies to everyone because I ended up going to a scene where you couldn't hear Clarence. And then I asked him a question. And so you never heard the answer. But the answer was roughly that with the red cat, there was no issues whatsoever working with it. And he uses it himself. So nothing to worry about. All right, go ahead, Clarence. Okay, so um, a couple of, well, one, one other, well, let me show you these examples. Um, this this example on the left, um, let me expand this a little bit, is an unmodified camera. Uh, it's a Canon R C or R A. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Let me get the right one up here. I'm ahead of myself. So this is I've got the same image up. It looks like so. Let me find the right image. Well, we'll skip that. This this is a Canon R A, uh, which is an astro specific camera. Uh, it should perform really well for ast for astrophotography work, and it does right. a good job. But you can see, um, you know, this is Orion, of course, Betelgeuse here, Rosette, Nebula here. There's a little hint of uh, Barnard's Loop and uh, other objects. You can barely see the witch head down here in this corner. Uh, these were, I, I think, five stacked images, very nothing too intense, just five one-minute-long exposures. Uh, on a regular star tracker um, as a, as a comparison though this is the modified camera and so i'll let me move these over here so you can see them both um, this is a, a canon r6 uh, visible plus h alpha modified the same exposure lengths um, <laughs> and and stacked you can see there's a lot more of that red nebulosity wow. coming through um, and the reason is we had filters designed, um, custom designed, uh, because we found that the Canon RA and like the D810A Nikon 
were not quite what they should be, in my opinion. They weren't quite sensitive enough in the H-alpha region, but ours also will um, encompass and include the oxygen regions of, of the sky. And then there's a steep cutoff, which then eliminates uh, the near infrared part of the spectrum. For um, most Milky Way shooters uh, and including, you know, Orion, things like that, they like that because right out of the camera, you can see the colors are pretty natural. Um, you don't get that purple or magenta cast over everything. That's where you, you get that when you're introducing the near infrared light, which would be from a full spectrum camera. Now a full spectrum camera, you can put a visible plus H alpha filter on the front of your lens and get this result. But this is the most popular filter option that we provide just because it performs really well and it's very user friendly. Okay, so real quick before you change that picture, the yep. most popular one is visible plus H alpha and the benefit of visible plus H alpha versus full spectrum is again, just in short. So the benefit is it's extremely user friendly because everything comes right out of the camera, very natural instead of overwashed with a lot of magentas or other colors. So the contrast remains very nice, like you can see here, and the colors look very natural without you know, heavy-handed um, post-processing to correct things. Oh man, yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, Chris Whiting asks, um, what, what, what is needed to use that visible plus H alpha for everyday daylight photos? So the, the UV IR blocking filters that we sell, those go on the front of your lens. Those will negate the modification or cut back the sensitivity so that it is only sensitive to normal visible light like a normal camera. Um, there are some companies out there that sell the little clip-ins that go on the camera right by the sensor. They're very convenient, but with anything over or wider than about 28 millimeters, you'll find you'll get soft corners or distortion or bad colors on the corners. So the on lens filters are far better uh, for performance with that. It, there's no problems at all. But the downside is, of course, if you're shooting a big 14 millimeter ultra wide, then you've got to buy the 150 millimeter filters to put on there um, to get the, the right um, performance. Gotcha. Okay. Right on. Uh, we have a couple good comments. Like for instance, Dan Gallander comes in and says, I must have deleted the end of my comment earlier. He says it should have ended with, and I couldn't be happier. So another mad props going out to Spencer's camera. I love it. Um, also, Hugh Brooks asks on that image that you showed us before, what focal length were you using? It seemed like that was kind of a wide, wide angle to see the whole Milky Way band. Do you recall at all? Yeah, so this this shot that's back up here, I'm assuming, is the one he's yes. talking about. Yeah. This was actually captured with the Irix 15 millimeter. Mm. Um, so it's a, a really wide lens, an f2.4. Um, but I overlapped each exposure. I didn't shoot, you know, 10 shots and then move 10. Sh I only shot one exposure, moved at about 50%, another exposure 50%. So they were about a half overlap, about 20 images across and then two layers up and down. Um, there was a little cropping, of course. I went way farther than I needed to and some distortion with that wide of a panel. But. Right, yeah. Cool. Well, let's get into some of the edit. Brendan Larson jumped on with us. He says, greetings from New Zealand. He's just bragging. He's just bragging because right now he has a panorama Milky Way. You lucky dog. He says, I just realized you're on now and I missed the start. I love this topic. I have a Spencer's modded camera, visible plus H alpha, and a second one that is on its way, full spectrum. So that is really really comforting to see that someone's used your service loved it so much and is back for more that's awesome. that's as much of props as you can get sweet so take us through some of these steps before we kill the uh, hour because man it's already 43 after the clock yeah we got we got 15 minutes so i'll try to be quick here so first of all i mentioned earlier how uh with the camera i shoot i do a white balance bracket so this is an example of that i have my window set up specifically so it shows seven thumbnails across because this is the first exposure or the, the, the an initial exposure and then it created six other white balance files from the same exposure. Then this would be exposure two, three. And so what I can do is I can click through these um, to see which one I prefer the color of and then choose the middle, you know, the one that meets my light. You can see it's getting warmer and warmer and then it jumps back to the other exposure. So that was what I was talking about is you get different 
color temperatures by doing that. Um, other cameras have similar, not the same kind of functions, um, but just trial and error when you first get to a scene, tweak your color temperature. Um, there are, of course, you can do a, a customer preset white balance and then go in and tweak on the calibration grid to go more red, more blue, more green, more magenta, and refine that color temperature so it's be uh, better right out of the camera. Does that make sense, Aaron? I'm pretty sure it does. There's definitely okay. some questions I was tackling in my brain, so I honestly missed enough to really confirm for you. But just everyone understand that the, the work of this is also talked about in another live stream that we had with Mary Beth Kaczynski. And I will go ahead, for those of you who are members of the Guild, I will share a portion where Mary Beth shows her white balance process for these kind of images. And I will post that video here, here this week. So if you're in the Guild already, awesome. Look for that to be posted here shortly. In a few days. Okay, so so this image was captured up here in the Uinta Mountains in the summer, uh, late summer. Um, this is, I think, five images stacked, uh, just simply in sequator, non-tracked, um, and it produced this TIFF file. Uh, you can see, and like a lot of times, no matter if it's a modified or unmodified camera, the color may not be perfect for you. So I do some very basic edits initially. Normally, I would um, duplicate this layer uh, a couple of times for foreground and sky editing uh, differently, but for the sake of time, I'll just j jump into the, the background layer here. So in Camera Raw, very simply, um, and this, this technique has been used and taught a lot for a long time, and I found that I really like it. I'll just crank up the vibrance and saturation all the way so you can really see these colors, and then you can tweak this to where you get a, I prefer to have the sky kind of a little more blue and the Milky Way warm. And then you can in, either increase or reduce the magentas and greens to where you get a middle road. And you can see right here, there's not much difference that I went from the original white balance hmm, yeah. as shot. So if you do that custom white balance, it usually gets you really close and then you're doing small refinements here. Um, then I'll just bring these back down and it looks really washed out now because you had all that color visible, but you know, you can bring up your vibrance and then all your other basic edits are really the same as you would do with an unmodified camera. So, you know, um, and Aaron is, is a master at this stuff. Um, you don't want to be too heavy handed on things, but you know, play with your shadows, your whites. I tend to bring the whites down a little because you don't want to overblow your stars when you're stretching everything else, but you know, highlights, shadows, you can, that helps your foreground. Um, but really just basic editing, okay. um, you know, uh, techniques other, other than the color temperature, which you could use that same technique on an unmodified camera file as well. See, I want to emphasize that again for everybody so that you come in here thinking, Oh good. He's going to show us how we can finally edit with these Astro modified camera pictures because they're going to be tough he just said it's not that much different. So let's just emphasize the few differences or maybe the few adjustments that you do a little bit differently because it's Astro modded. Just those few steps. Just say those again. So really just refining the temperature and the tint. And again, like I did before, I'll do it one more time. You crank up the saturation and vibrance sliders to really reveal that color. Um, this helps me especially because I am a little color deficit i have i, I oh. can't see colors as well as some people so when i do that it really pumps those colors up and then you can balance it i say the word balance because you know you don't want you know like this where where the milky way is mostly blue right. i try to get a good middle road where the milky way is more warm and the sky is cool and then the same with the greens and magentas so something in that range and you can always come back and refine as well but then you bring these sliders back down and you know you can you can increase to a, a more pleasing uh, result <laughs> from there awesome isn't that terrific everyone when you think about the challenging learning curve to go into astro modified cameras the only thing that you really have hit in your face is the big magenta color that you got to white balance off. And once you do, it's like you're working with any other Milky Way image and it's nothing crazy. You can do it already and you didn't even know it. So I'll show you on the next image though. It, it um, has more of that reddish cast. Ooh, awesome. Yeah, good example. So so this, this image has that red magenta cast. I pulled this intentionally just to show you how this 
same process works really well. So again, camera raw or in Lightroom, uh, same thing basically. Um, and then just under the basics tab, crank up your vibrance and saturation all the way. And you can see it's very red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're going to bring this slider down to cool it off. Looks like the Aurora we just had in Norway that was pink. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Crying a little bit, Mary Beth. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that on, <laughs> on Facebook somewhere. So you're just going to balance this down a ways. And then the greens we're going to bring down a little more than normal to help reduce some of those magentas. Um, and then you'll see it gets it back to a pretty normal uh, color balance. And again, you could refine that better. Another technique I use a lot is uh, within the color mixer. This is a really powerful tool that I've learned to use over the last couple of years. Um, you can bring, so for instance, this darker color, your magentas and your blues, you can bring the luminance down on those to help increase contrast and bring the reds up or the oh. oranges. You know, and so there's a lot of that detail in here, and you can see that's a pretty poor image, really. But um, mm -hmm. this was this was during a, a workshop, so I wasn't babysitting my camera very well. Gotcha. But so there's a, a lot of things you can do there, and then under the hue, is a, you can attack that magenta and purple by forcing it to be more blue uh, as well. So then you can see that's less magenta, and, and you can refine that even better to to get those colors where you want them to be. Man, I, that is going to be the toughest part for some people because maybe they've never played with the HSL panel, but that's going to be right. a little blind moving of the sliders back and forth. Just know there's nothing you can do wrong. Just keep playing with it. See what it make, see what changes what and see how you like it. So the hue and luminance typically, you never went into saturation? I don't I don't use saturation. I, I stay away from that as much as I can. I use vibrance. Okay. It seems to be less dramatic and, and you know, uh, overpowering. Um I, I also sometimes will go into the calibration tab and play with the reds and, you know, to mm. get that. If you bring up, you know, you can bring up the reds or the blues to change the overall balance of that. Um, those are relative, the, the calibration tab is relatively new. It's been around for a while, but most people don't ever touch it, but it's pretty powerful if you learn how to use it. What's your typical process for avoiding making and knocking back your nebulas from being pink anymore? Um, a lot of it is that color mixer, you know, I'll go in and, and bring the reds up more red. So they're not as pink, uh, or I can do a col a selection, a selective color mm. layer and just bring up the reds or uh, create, uh, change the hue and in, in that selective color, uh, a lot of it too, with your background, if it's retaining too much magenta, then you can do a dark selection and feather it nicely and then go in and knock it down hard more selectively that way. Okay, awesome. And those those are all tools that are good for even an unmodified camera. Um, but, you know, it's a little more useful when you have any kind of color problems. So is there really anything that you have now learned after years of editing Astro Modified images that you can point to and say, I wish I knew this at the very beginning? You know, um, well, maybe a couple of things, you know, first of all, a good custom white balance helps a lot. Two, there are really like 10 or 15 basic tools in Photoshop that you just have to learn well. Um, don't use the presets. They can they can get you to a basis point, but you still need to know those tools, you know, as, as I'm sure you would agree, you know, there's yep. these basic um, adjustment tools in Camera Raw that will do 90% of the work for you. And then after that, it's just little refinements here and there, you know, reducing noise or balancing the foreground with the sky so that they blend well. And, you know, th those can all be very technical, but 90% of your work can be done right here in Lightroom or in a quick layer of the sky versus the foreground and edit those a little differently and, and you're there. Awesome. I, I just hope that everyone's getting the understanding that holy crap, this is not going to be a giant learning curve for me to do this. If you were on the fence about going to Spencer's cameras and getting an actual Astro Mod this year, and you're thinking, I need to get better at this or better at that, you've just heard that if you can take a Milky Way image and edit it, you're already there. You just have to tackle it and tweak a little differently. You don't have to learn a new program. He never brought up PixInsight that is required. I mean, have you ever edited in PixInsight? Oh, I've done a lot of that, but um, I'm 
I'm a Photoshop guy. Yeah. You know, I le started learning that 20 years ago and uh, I dove in hard probably six or seven years ago and bought a ton of, uh, you know, tutorial video classes and really dove in hard. And, but I will tell you, like I said, 90% of the work can be done with 10 or 15 basic tools. And that gets you, you know, to a really good point. And then after that, then it's really tight details that you just have to learn each tool separately. Okay, right on. Is there anything in the edit that I should hold you up here for, or are we ready to go to the final questions? No, I think, I mean, that's a very basic, you know, uh, correction of colors and that kind of thing. You could go down every one of these little uh, steps in Lightroom or Camera Raw and dive in deeply, but that's the basic edit. All right, awesome, fantastic. Go ahead and switch back to us with you. We won't be able to hear Clarence for a second while he switches over to the other screen. Um, I'm gonna get this big window off of his face there. So everyone remember, this is your final chance. So Grant, I haven't seen you recopy and paste that. I'm gonna look for it as well while we're tackling some of the first questions. But I just wanna give another mad props over to Clarence coming from Brendan Larson down in New Zealand saying the amount of HA that I'm getting is incredible. He goes, it's just the, the, uh, bah, 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 the, da, 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 the modded camera, especially with the LP extreme filter is completely amazing. So he loves it. Clarence. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, no, no problem at all. Oh, it's not shared yet. Um, okay. Yeah. Going over to the eclipse right now. Oh, that looks that looks fake. It looks so awesome. It does, doesn't it? That's <laughs> with a Canon R6 Visible Plus H Alpha filter um, of the Lunar Eclipse uh, just the other day. So it's incredible. Really? There's, a, a, there's a lot of editing in that. It, like, a, like you said, it almost looks fake. But you can see all of that data, all that information that comes out of that camera um, to produce an incredible image to the point where it basically looks fake. Um, that's incredible. I mean, you get the lunar moon right there. That's the orb that we're looking at right, right there. there. And uh, the color of the stars. We've talked about with Jeroen out in the Netherlands, we're about keeping our star color and just the astro modification bringing out the oranges of Rigel, the blue, the, actually the blue of Rigel, the orange of Betelgeuse, and it's just the color of the other stars around it. It's almost as if you've been colorblind and now you can see. Yeah, the really impressive thing about this image is all of this dust in, in the galaxy that's <laughs> just woven around here. And yeah. then there's the witch head and, you know, there's just a lot of data in that image. <laughs> Why did you have to go and make the best lunar image to make all of us feel like ours might not look as cool? Yeah, it's not mine. <laughs> oh, this isn't I'd yours? I'd love to take credit, but oh. it's not mine. No, this is a good client of mine. Uh, Astro Falls, Bray Falls is his name. His, his handle is Astro Falls on Instagram. Okay. He's, you know, 500,000 followers. He's pretty well known. So uh, That guy has nothing. I got 20,000 followers. Well, wait a sec. <laughs> <laughs> so then when you look at this, he's using your gear, an Astro modification from Spencer's cameras, and uh, couldn't have a better mascot showing off the business here. That's fantastic. It's just so much more busy than I expected it to be, too. I love it. Oh, man. There's just no boring part of the night sky, is there? As we're learning right. with the, the James Webb, man. Oh, gosh. Okay. So we are now looking at two minutes till. I'm going to try and find Grant's final question, but this is everyone's last chance to tackle what we might have for a final question. I know that there was one from Chris I needed to come back to. Okay. Chris says, what is needed to use a visible plus HA for everyday... I, actually, did I ask that about daylight photos? I may have asked uh, that. I think so, yeah. The UVI are blocking filter. Okay, we'll and then that. Rakesh's question about the difference between the full spectrum and such. Okay, cool. So I'm scrolling up to find grants. I wish I could search these more. Ba -ba 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 -bum -bum. So thank you so much, Clarence, for coming out and doing this. I mean, everyone should know that I asked him yesterday. He was so generous to just get <laughs> last-minute request and join us tonight. And so mad props to you. As we were talking about earlier, Tim was like, hey, everybody, let's put – no, it was actually – it was a Frank or Paul. It was Frank – 
No, I'm, I'm mixing names up. It was Frank. It was Frank Pally. Okay, so he was saying, hit the like button. Say thanks to Clarence by hitting the like button. But also, more importantly, go over to Spencer's Camera and Photo and hit the subscribe button on their YouTube channel. Join me in following them, and let's help that channel grow, and we can get a lot of good Astro Mod tip tips and information from him uh grant i am having a hard time finding your question other than the comments about the audio being gone so i'm going to keep scrolling here my final question for you will be is there anything in the astro modified tech that's coming that is potentially coming that we have to look forward to in the future of our photography well for milky way shooters and stuff the the newest thing and we're refining it a little bit are some different filtering uh, that will help uh, increase the overall end result for a higher quality image. Um, our, and we have new filters coming that will help with um, reflections on the sensor and uh, hot spots with infrared lenses and things like that. But it's all very subtle, really high tech, te technical, uh, you know, based uh, stuff that, that would bore the heck out of you all. But <laughs> uh, just know that the, the end result is we're constantly increasing quality of the end result image so that it's the best it can be. Oh, man. Uh, what a brilliant space that he has out there in Alpine, Utah, and then going in and working with the room that he has that, uh, what do you call it, a clean room that clean is room, brilliantly right? organized for it. Uh, it's fantastic. Now, Grant, I have gone to the very top of the chat and you and saying 36 degrees this morning. It's been very cold in Oregon and Bandon, but I don't find your question. I think there may be a chance, Grant, that it's done this before with other other viewers where a question just does not show up on my end. And it's very rare. Um, and I've only heard of it happening with Keith. But let's see if it can be fixed for you, Grant. If you can copy and paste that again, that'd be awesome. And who knows, maybe in the comment you're copying and pasting and youtube is just blocking it i mean you didn't declare any religious affiliation or political affiliation i hope in the question <laughs> so here's a few thanks to you from dave thanks clarence and aaron for putting the stream together tim farmer says efrf drop in do you have color and soft issues for that efrf drop in none none, none. there's they are very that was that took almost a year and a half to perfect before we pushed it out ah. so that all of your corners are sharp colors are perfect it's there's a lot of work and and testing involved in that oh awesome sweet tim says i have 10 followers so you can find tim farmer over on youtube <laughs> let's get him up to 100 by the end of the week um holy moly from frank pally shelby diamond star which of course is mary beth says thanks clarence and aaron utah for the win or f the world i think both are fitting um tim farmer are you oh that's actually not directed to us um thanks from ron thanks from tim farmer thanks from rakesh he says this was really helpful clarence bob rakoski says thank you clarence and aaron to infinity and beyond and to the winter milky way we go absolutely um ah, da, 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 da. jerry woodruff jerry thompson and chris woodruff both say thank you clarence and cheers to you all from frank pally loved it aaron thanks and frank pally photography he probably has a youtube channel too go follow him click on his name you can go follow him and tim farmer and tim says i'm out to photo the moon later and thanks what's the moon you go take pictures of the moon I never take pictures of the moon. The moon gets in the way of my photography. Um, I wish Sony and Mike and Nikon offered that drop-in stuff. Mary Beth says she wishes Sony would do that. That's that's too bad. Yeah. Rakesh says, "Is there a way to use the filter without modification and get similar results?" Um, unfortunately, no. The camera is blind to uh, to to H alpha until it's modified. So you can put whatever filter you want on there, and it still won't see it. Ah, darn. Okay, so Rakesh, we do have to go through Spencer's cameras to get our camera set up. Uh, I can't wait to do it. If someone were to buy a new camera, dedic or new or used, dedicated to an Astro Mod, what's your like beach babe of a camera that you want to modify the most? We like so, works easy, always works. It's fantastic quality. Yeah, I mean any any of the Nikon Z series cameras, the Sony A7 III, A7 IV, they're phenomenal. Um, and the Canon R series cameras. You can't go wrong with any of those. Okay, sweet. So if any of you heard that, that's your list of what you need to go get and grab, or if you already have, make sure you get over to Clarence. Thank you so much, Clarence. Thank you, everybody. We're off for the night. I appreciate everything that you guys have done coming out to the Milky Way Wednesday. We'll be back next Wednesday at um, 
Let's see. We'll be. Ne- oh, I want to change this clip. Let me change this real quick. We'll be back here next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And Clarence, where are you going next to capture some images? Do you have a chance to do that soon? Just um, did the lunar eclipse. A, a lot of testing right here in the backyard. A lot of telescope filter tests and things, deep sky shooting. I do want to get out probably next weekend and, and when the clouds are gone someday and get, <laughs> yeah. get Milky Way and get, sorry, get Orion a lot. I have a lot of tests I need to do on the Orion region in, entirely. Absolutely. Sweet. Thank you again. Have a great night, Clarence. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, we'll everybody. see you all next week.